Hello and welcome to this episode of NRI Affairs. Uh, I am joining from Mianjin, the unceded lands of the Yegera and Turbal people, and I bring a special guest today. With me is noted historian, journalist, political commentator, and Marxist thinker Vijay Prashad. He is in our neck of the woods, and he's going to be lecturing and touring across New Zealand and Australia in the coming days. Um, he's managed to stir up quite a hornet's nest even before he's arrived, and we're going to do some hard talk on a lot of issues and get uh, get his take on, on a lot of things that are happening in this part of the world and beyond. Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure. And I, I love that you said hello and welcome, because that's how we used to do it in News Click. Hello <laughs> and welcome to News Click. So I was smiling because of that. Reminiscent. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. All right. So, um, you know, there's so much to cover because you've done so much and you've got an opinion on so much. Uh, but we we'll begin with one of the things that you said that gave me pause was, uh, where does the story begin? And oftentimes that sort of um, is a measure of your politics, is a measure of your humanity, where you see things uh, the way you do and why you see things the way you do. And because we are NRI affairs and we, you know, uh, one of the things that we do cover is the political landscape in India, how it affects the diaspora, all of that. I wanted to talk about um, in the context of, say, you know, the ideas you've explored in darker nations and then in poorer nations and now hopefully in brighter nations, um, this mapping of stories and sovereignty, political, economic, cultural, where do you see the story of India at this point? I know you're going to talk about Modi and you're going to talk about India. So not to take anything away from the things that you're going to share later, but if you wanted to give us something on that. Yeah, you know, I mean, India is interesting because India is both a very, very old civilization and a very young country. Um, and that's something quite fascinating as just just as a thought experiment. You know, there are old cultural traditions, there are roots and and and, you know, there are there are stories that go back uh, centuries. You know, families can measure um, their their lineages quite far back, not my own family, which is a family of being uprooted several times. Um, but many other families, you know, live in ancestral villages, have ancestral homes and so on. Um, there is a kind of ancient that's alive and well today. It's not gone. And yet India as the state is extremely young. I mean, you can say it's 100 years old, you know, when the freedom movement in the 1920s starts to really get going when the masses enter the various satyagrahas of the 1920s, the Indian nation starts to get born. It's a very young project. The, the, the nation state itself is extremely young. It's not even 100 years old. Um, you know, we, we say, well, it's an ancient country. That's both true and not true. So in that sense, what are we judging? Uh, when we say, you know, where is India today? Are we talking about the civilization? I would say that civilizationally, India is going through a crisis, a, a deep crisis of civilization. As a country, I don't think the crisis is as grave because it's a young country trying to find itself, establish institutions, which some of them had been pretty well established in the 1940s and have been unfortunately dismantled over the last period. Um, but the civilizational crisis, I think, is pretty acute. And, you know, I'm not the only one to talk about it. Amartya Sen has been writing about this for a while at that level, the question of the civilization and so on. What does one mean when one says there's a civilizational crisis? You know, when, when India was almost coming to be born, I'm talking now about the Indian Republic. Obviously, Pakistan, Bangladesh have different stories. When the Indian Republic was coming to be born, Jawaharlal Nehru reflected, wrote a very interesting book while he was in prison, um, which was later published as Discovery of India, 1946, just the year before independence. In Discovery of India, Nehru invents, in a way, you know, a history for India. He goes back and he says, what is Indian civilization? Because, you know, again, you can start anywhere. You know, where do you begin? And Nehru makes an interesting judgment. His civilization 
is born in what he considers the syncretism of India. It's very similar to another book written around that time, The Rediscovery of India. I think it's called The Rediscovery of India by Humayun Kabir, who writes a similar book. What Nehru does is he goes to this period um, around the, let's say, just before the colonial uh, conquest of India. And he suggests that at this time, Hinduism, which was being born then out of Brahmanism and so on, Hinduism, Islam, which comes to India, you know, at least the subcontinent in the seventh century, just after Muhammad's revelation, very quickly comes to Gujarat, to the Bora community and so on. And he argues that this period of coming together when Sikhism is birthed out of Hinduism and Islam, this this coming together, this melding of, of various influences creates the Indian civilization. And so this idea of syncretism or the kind of, um, you know, Sufi bhakti merging together, of, that's the essence of the Indian civilization. Very interesting argument Nehru is making in 46, trying to argue that, look, India is not a Hindu country. It's not a Muslim country. It's not any, it's its, its own complicated melding of traditions and cultures. And in a way, it's a clever move that Nehru makes because this is against the entire argument of the Pakistan movement. It's the entire argument of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh and the Hindu Mahasabha. He's arguing against all of them, saying, wait a minute, fellas, this is our civilization. Well, they attempted to make that anchor for civilization, the core part of the Indian development project from the 1950s. That is being unraveled in India today. I mean, there is this edge that suggests, well, why can't the Hindu majority define Indian civilization? And that's a big reversal from the Nehruvian dream. There's a reason why the Hindu right hates Nehru so much. It doesn't have to do with the license Raj, and it doesn't have to do with, you know, uh, the protectionist economy, even doesn't even have to do with concessions made to China in the 50s. Nothing to do with any of that. They hate. They have to hate Nehru because they have to kill Nehru's civilizational project in order to inaugurate their own. And that's the real essence of the, the horns that India is sitting on now. You know, there are still people arguing for the Nehruvian dream in a way, um, but they are increasingly a minority. Um, there is a kind of torrent that is making the argument that, look, why not be a Hindu majoritarian country? That That's, after all, the majority. Now, why it's a civilizational crisis is that this idea of Hindu majority doesn't mean the same across the country. So, for instance, in Tamil Nadu, there's no appetite for this. Um, you know, in, 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 the, in the Telugu speaking regions of Telangana and and, and Andhra Pradesh, there's no appetite for this. So there is a crisis even within the Indian polity over this fight over what's the vision. I think the CAA, the, the, the Citizenship Amendment Act, um, you know, all of that brought this civilizational question to the fore. And, and I, I think that's, that's where I see India is today. It's in the middle of an existential debate about what should be the character of Indian civilization. Interesting. You um, are going to be talking about the fact that you think there is not going to be a Modi 3.0. What do you base that on? Well, firstly, the concept of Modi 3.0 was an ideological concept that the Hindu right promoted because they said, if you win the first election, it's Modi 1.0. If you win the second election, it's Modi 2.0. And then if you win, well, that's ludicrous, you know, because... Um, when you name an operating system, Microsoft 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, there better be something more than just the fact that you're releasing a new version. It better have something new in it. You know, it's got to have, otherwise it's just a marketing technique. You know, if you've got like, um, you know, Apple phone, Apple iPhone one, and then you bring out iPhone two and it's the same as one, just, you know, new color. That's ridiculous. It, you know, you got to have something more than a. So there was actually a Modi 2.0. In fact, there was because in the second government of Modi, they were much more aggressive. 
on these mm. civilizational issues. Um, the first government, they tried to establish themselves with a little talk of development and, you know, Vikas is the main thing. But in the government number two, they went hard. C Citizenship Amendment Act became a big thing and so on. They went after the farmers, um, you know, and then they started questioning the loyalty of the farmers. They were much more aggressive on the civilizational issues. Um, what is Modi 3.0? So there's two reasons why I think there isn't one. The first reason is Modi didn't actually win this election outright. Uh, he, they won the capacity for him to become prime minister again, but there were lots of reversals. This was an anti-incumbency election. I mean, where they lost in UP, they gained in Orissa. But in Orissa, it was anti-incumbency, just as it was in UP. So they just benefited from the fact that there were other parts of India where the incumbent was seen as worse than them. This was not a mandate for Modi. This was not a sweeping election for Modi. The electoral system first past the post is very unfortunate because it basically rewards people who are maybe the second choice, um, mm. not the first choice. That's just the way it is, right? Because the mandate splits. Anyway, he won the election. Um, but, you know, it wasn't a mandate win. It was a muted win. Secondly, there's no agenda. Like, what is Modi planning to do in this, this third term of his? He has never set out an agenda. His uh, speeches that he's been giving, and those have been few and far between, have been about what? I mean, I challenge people to tell me, what is the Modi agenda in this term? Like, what do they want to do? Uh, build the Ram Mandir? That was last time. They, they were not able to complete it. They did the the, the you know, the, the whole ceremony last time. It was an election ploy. Didn't work. They lost in that very seat in, in Uttar Pradesh. So, you know, what's Modi 3.0 apart from what um, the BJP office is saying? So do you want to just take what they say and publish that? That's not journalism. I want to ask in terms of the concept of something like a 3.0, A, you didn't get a mandate. Show me whether you didn't get a mandate. And B, you don't have an agenda. There's no 3.0. This is Modi 2.0 B. <laughs> All right. Um, also, I wanted to touch upon, you know, the rise of Hindutva in the diaspora, right? And a lot of times what we see, and you might have touched upon this somewhere, is that people are seeking connection to culture. They're seeking connection to heritage. And, you know, if it's right in front of you, that's what you're going to take. And so one of the things that organizations like, say, Hindus for Human Rights are trying to promote is a more inclusive um, interpretation of the faith. And one of the questions that does get asked is then, what can organizations such as Hindus for Human Rights do in the diaspora to be a, a, a more legitimate choice and an alternative to Hindutva forces? Well, there's many ways to answer this. The first is, I, I just wanted to say that it's really interesting that about 110 years ago in California, when the Gadar Party was founded, in fact, on, I think, May 1st, 1913, it's very interesting that the first openly left-wing political organization is not founded in India. It's founded in Stockton, California. That's the first openly left-wing, you know, left of the Samajwadi tradition. These were revolutionaries, you know. And then after the Bolshevik Revolution, the Sardars from California go to study in the Soviet Union, and then they come back to India and they become part of um, the, the revolutionary movement in India. You know, some of them come with names like last name Singh Canadian because they come from Canada. The number of people with the last name Canadian and so on. Um, the Gadar party had a newspaper called Gadar Di Gunj. And in the Gadar Di Gunj, they would regularly publish poetry, beautiful, very simple, but beautiful Punjabi poetry about revolution and so on. There was a poem that really struck me from 1914, very strong poem, where the poet wrote, as long as we are slaves in our homeland, we will not get respect in the fields of California. In other words, as workers in the United States in the 1910s, they felt that because they were colonized in India, they would be treated poorly in the United States. So I thought about this poem a lot because I think, imagine the inverse. There were, when Modi came to the United States at one of his tours, he did a big show at 
Madison Square Garden. Very large number of NRIs went there. And one of the things the NRIs were saying to reporters outside was Modi makes us feel proud to be Indian. It's the mm. opposite, inverse of that Gadar poem. Meaning mm. now that Modi's a strong Indian leader and walks the stage and he meets leaders and so on, there's a kind of interesting performative nature of Modi. It's not like Manmohan Singh didn't meet the US president or that Rajiv Gandhi didn't or that, you know, they all did. I mean, Nehru was a tall leader of India in the world stage. Um, mm. You know, it's not like they didn't, but somehow Modi has been able to fabricate this idea that he's friends with, you know, with George W. Bush or friends with this one and that one and a buddy, you know, that sort of thing. Um, there's this feeling that, you know, India is now a rising power. And because India is a rising power, we get respect. In Australia and New Zealand, I'm an Indian, you know, people are like, oh, it's a major country, you know, it's a, oh, the, you know, Modi, you know, Modi is a tough guy, he's a player on the world. That's a big part of a lot of apolitical people just saying it makes me proud to be an Indian, to see Modi, you know, speak out and so on. The second thing that's interesting, which I agree with you, um, from the 1980s, I feel as the world has shifted to an, a kind of new a revival of religion in general across the world, in all religious communities, growth of Pentecostalism, a kind of return to religion for solace, maybe austerity politics, you know, things are not going well in people's careers, a return to religion has taken place. Much the same in the Indian communities. I mean, I, I remember interviewing people in the United States when I was writing my book, Karma of Brown Folk. Now, you know, 25 years ago, the book came out, ages ago, um, I remember talking to people, you know, they'd come in the 1970s and 80s to the US engineers. And I asked them, you know, guys, when you were at IIT Madras or wherever you were, um, did you know anything about like Sanskrit or, you know, you were all like mugging up your engineering yeah. books and yeah. yeah, I mean, you didn't know the first thing about a puja. I mean, you know, all the bong boys, you know, what did you know about Kali Puja and, you know, your, your mother was doing the things. You were like shoved a, you know, <laughs> mitai in your mouth and then went running back to mug up your books, you know. And they all used to say, man, you know, we are we, like when it's the puja, you know, th these and the women as well, not just the men. Women were also swatting, you know, their medical books and they were not paying it. They came, you know, to the United States without any real knowledge. So they started manufacturing traditions. You know, they would do the pujo, they would call up the mother in Calcutta and say, well, what do we do? What should we cook? What kind of dal was that again? That sort of thing. And, and that's okay. And why were they doing that? And very interesting. In the 1980s, 90s, in places like the United States, the attacks on Indians were rising. There were actually groups. There was a group in New Jersey called the Dot Busters, which used to run around trying to beat Indians up. In fact, killed somebody and so on. So at this time, people felt our children are being harassed in school for being Indian. So you've got to give them a sense of culture and history. And mm -hmm. they started buying Amar Chitra Katha comics for them to read, to learn. You know, it's a kind of potted version of your past, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so religion returns. And then I remember the um, activists from the Vishwa Hindu Parishad used to go and at the temples that were being created, they would start having house parties to raise money uh, to destroy the Babri Masjid in, in, in Ayodhya and to build a Ram temple. And people with no idea about anything to do with Ram or never read the Ramayan, maybe read the Amar Chitra comics on Ramayan, you know, had no clue, would go to these things, put money in the table and got drawn into Hindutva. Um, many people just with no real political commitment, but you know, part of it was the return to religion. Um, and as people have aged, you know, because this migration is all very young, even in Australia, it's very young migration. You know, it's people now in their 70s, let's say, um, you know, that wave that came out of India after 1975 emergency and so on, a wave after the, the, the killing of uh, the, you know, the Golden Temple thing in 84, the mm -hmm. anti-Sikh violence, you know, the waves of migrants come after that. Waves of Sri Lankans come, Sri Lankan Tamils come after. You know, these waves are all predictable and recent. And people come and then this religion thing hits them. And I, I just think that these are not people who are 
you know, programmatically Hindutva. I mm. think this is a kind of soft, pragmatic situation, which is why I've always thought that these sorts of groups that, you know, you guys have been building are so important because it gives people an alternative. It raises questions. It asks people to think about things because I don't think they are like hardcore anti-Muslims, you know. I just think that for various reasons, people think Modi is great. You know, it's good to be religious, good for our children. But they're not hardcore. Like, they don't th realize that being pro Modi actually is sort of anti Muslim. Right. No, it is, it is a more nuanced uh, sort of a conversation for sure. And um, I, I suppose with young people, you know, I have a 15 year old and I feel like they see the world quite differently and they see less boundaries than we do. So the hope is that they will then progress in a way that sort of naturally takes out some of these you know, the tensions, inherent tensions between religion and all of that. Um, I did, but we can't talk about all of this in sovereignty and not speak about some of the things that you've, you know, you've been accused of and you've been, you've been uh, questioned on. And one of the things about this petition that went out that we were sort of thinking is that, you know, when we disagree with someone, it would be good to have those conversations and have, a, you know, have an opportunity to actually ask you and debate with you and bring those things to the fore. So um, I know platforming is a big question in, in lots of spaces because there's there are limited platforms and there are lots of things and lots of people who deserve to be on those platforms. So from that point of view, I understand that argument, but at the same time, when we disagree so, uh, so you know, passionately with someone, it's good to ask the questions. So, you know, one of the things broadly and, it, you know, taking it out of academia, because I'm not an academic, but from what I understand, one of the things in a broader sense is that you recognize imperialism when it's rooted in the West. But when we see imperialistic actions of countries such as China or any other country, you tend to couch it in very different terms and you tend to view it very differently. And of course, that's created a lot of heartburn because in these parts of the world, there is a lot of support for the Uyghur uh, movement. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of documentation that is available to activists here. And they see it quite starkly as a opposite to what, you know, what your sort of point of view is. Do you want to expand on that at all? Yeah, I mean, look, the first thing is one has to always start with the facts. And the facts are that there really is only one imperialistic force in the world. The United States and its allies spend 75% of world military spending. The Chinese only 10%. Um, the United States has 900 military bases around the world and will be soon using the Tyndall Air Base to have their B-52 bombers with nuclear capacity on Australian soil. And the Australian people are paying for that expansion. Uh, I don't see any Chinese military bases anywhere in, in the world. The, everybody points to this base in Djibouti. I've been there, uh, not into the base, but around it. There's a US base not far from where the Chinese base is. The Chinese base is a naval station, which is there to support the UN mission against piracy. It's not really a military base um, like the US military bases. So people who talk about we're against all imperialisms, I, I really don't see what they're talking about. There is one imperialistic force in the world. There are not many imperialisms. Um, secondly, large countries in general have had a problem dealing with their minority populations. Um, it's not just China, it's India as well. Um, you know, wh what is India's behavior towards the Kashmiris, for instance, in the, in the Kashmiri Valley? Um, Kashmir has one of the highest um, densi the density of populations of military to civilians. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2016, I was on a television show and I was asked about Kashmir and I said, well, what other word to use, but that it's an occupation. Um, if you have, if you need to have so many soldiers controlling so few civilians, you've got an occupation on your hands. I don't even understand why people accuse me of being having an Indian state position on Kashmir. Um, you know, in 2019, I wrote an article saying Kashmir is in danger of becoming a new Palestine. Um, that was in 2019. You know, I've been at this for a very long time. So I, I don't even get what people say half the time. You know, they'll say, 
Yeah. Yeah. Can we speak more though specifically about China and the. No, no, I'm coming there. I'm coming there. I just want to set it up because you know I, I don't want to get too far afield. I, I want to set up this answer properly so it's not misunderstood as as it might be. So big states have have these issues with with their populations. Not just the Chinese that have it. I mean, the United States massacred its native populations, massacred them over the course of, of 100 years. And they were so successful that Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf uh, wrote a very large section saying they did a Lebensraum. They killed these lesser races. So we are going to do the same against the Slavic people. And, you know, people who live in, in New Zealand, Australia, know very well what this means. You know, wipe out native populations, put them in little garrison communities, and then you enjoy the fruits of the rest. And then migrants can come in and also enjoy native lands. You started yeah. this program by saying we are on this land, but where are the people? They've been killed so that you can live there. The Chinese are not doing that in, in Xinjiang. What is the problem that the Chinese are trying to solve in Xinjiang? A few years ago, I was in Idlib in Syria, where I was able to meet some of the leaders of the East Turkmenistan movement. Um, this is a very small fringe group which started um, a terrorist attack in the cities of Xinjiang, in Urumqi and so on. They blasted bombs in markets and places like that. The Chinese had several alternatives in front of them. They could have followed the American strategy. They could have carpet bombed sections of Urumqi. You know, that's what the Russians did in Grozny, in Chechnya. That's what the Americans did in Afghanistan, in Iraq you know, in, in all over the place, in Syria, they just carpet bomb areas the Israelis are doing in, in Gaza, carpet bombing Hamas. The Chinese did not carpet bomb. It's interesting. They, they didn't do any aerial bombardment. So I don't see how this is the same as any other thing. Secondly, what's interesting is, and, and I've talked to a lot of people in Xinjiang, Uyghurs and Chinese people that live there. Um, the other interesting thing is the Chinese decided not to just mass um, you know, put people in jail and throw the key away. They didn't want to build a Guantanamo. They did a third thing. They, yeah. they do say that they're close to a million people in, incarcerated. I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. They did a third strategy, which is what they consider the re-education strategy. Um, they, they brought people into these camps. They decided to teach them um, a form of Islam that is not violent and so on. They followed something that was created by people like Noman um, ben Taib, the Libyan who, who was part of the Killiam Foundation in the UK, superly controversial foundation because they got involved with the British government's de-radicalization program. But this is the strategy the Chinese use. Now, is it genocide? If you go to Xinjiang, you will see the whole place. There's mosques everywhere. There are Uyghurs all over the place. I don't think, you know, you can't use these terms loosely. Is what the Indian government doing in Kashmir genocide? That's another, the same people that say Uyghur genocide talk about this genocide, that genocide. Genocide is a very specific word that comes out of the UN Genocide Convention. Um, it could be inappropriate what the Chinese are doing. You may not like what they are doing. They're trying to solve a problem that they have. There could be lots of discussions about it. But you see, this becomes a litmus test. If you don't condemn the genocide against the Uyghurs, then you are a genocide denier. Um, th this is a play of words. You know, I'm not saying that what, the, I'm not denying what is happening there. There are places, re-education camps. Do I think it's a good thing that they're doing? Look, okay. I don't, you and I don't have to solve the problem of groups that are exploding bombs. We are under jurisdiction to create safety. How would you and I deal with acts of terror being, you know, um, sort of, what's it called? Um, what's that thing called you put the TV on with? A remote control from Syria, from, from Idlib, Syria. The leadership of this group is not even in Uzbekistan anymore. And it used to be in Afghanistan before. It's never really been in Xinjiang. They are living outside. They are, you know, doing these terror acts. If, if a group outside, for instance, Australia, starts to do terror acts in Australia, what do you think the Australian government will do to these people? And for people in Australia to criticize this kind of camp situation is rum because the Australian government runs concentration camps on islands offshore for people who are trying to migrate into Australia, leaving climate uh, disaster zones and so on. In Manus Island, not, 
but it's not the activists who are doing that that you no, know no. one sort of i'm not i'm not doing this either in china i'm not conducting the genocide so you know it's by the way it's exactly the same thing you know people are living in new zealand they out of nowhere having not criticized hundreds of people who come in to give talks with fulbright grants paid by the us government yeah people who are close to or maybe even getting grants that are from some israeli foundation they come and give talks from harvard university just in the arden is a harvard fellow nobody complains about all that but i was to come here okay just invited by some maori activists to give a few talks and suddenly there's a charge sheet with things i don't even recognize that he defended he's he's for the tigrayan genocide i've never written about ethiopia i've been to um addis ababa once to cover the deportation of ethiopians from saudi arabia i don't even know where half this stuff comes from frankly this is a charge sheet prepared against me which firstly is not even cites my own work it cites a nation hit piece on me written by a guy who spoke to me on the phone completely misrepresented everything i said it cites that article but they don't talk to me at all or or cite 40 books thousands of article not one citation i do hope that you know when you when you are in these talks the people who actually put their letter together i hope they do come and they bring some of this to the fore i have to say that some of the cited articles on the china situation make for quite a compelling read because it does document a lot of things that is in the public domain as well uh but i'll leave it at that no I no think- don't 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 leave it at that because i would also like to to hear your opinion on that because i have strong i mean you know there was a guy called adrian lens for instance yes. i don't know if you know anything about him no i don't yeah it's important that you do because adrian lens is a right wing christian fundamentalist german who has a who works for a foundation which has an office not far from the cia office in langley virginia oh, adrian I... lens is the guy who first published a report claiming there's a genocide against the uyghurs now you got to understand this guy is a right wing christian fundamentalist uh, who suddenly publishes a report worrying about what's happening to the muslims of china never having a track record before of saying anything about islam and lens incredibly fabricates material you know the photographs the the stuff that he writes about is extremely you know it's inflammatory um and where is he publishing this in washington dc which is running an actual camp guantanamo bay on stolen cuban soil where they've got children from across the muslim world who have been sitting there and will be there for their whole life because nobody wants to take them okay mm-hmm. there's no chinese camp that is going to hold people forever yeah and so a person sitting in washington dc in the middle of a heightened tension between the united states and china suddenly writes a report and then it it just inflames world opinion people are like oh my god the uyghurs never having heard of the uyghurs before people who a generation before were worried about guantanamo bay where there are still people sitting in prison and have been sitting in prison for over 20 years there were teenagers who are now in their late 30s who spent their whole life in an ex- in camp x-ray in guantanamo suddenly there is no consideration about any of the and everything is focused on china it's extremely you see it's extremely worrying how quickly propaganda can well, shape that- public opinion that is true and you know it's the social media cycle right today you're the flavor of the month and tomorrow something else is going to inflame having said that though it's almost this thing about like you know you can hold multiplicities in that sense that yes that is terrible and so can it be in china and one of the articles that they cited was by jude kinsley i don't know if you had a chance to see it uh beijing's lo- long struggle to control the mineral wealth basically takes that angle and talking about how you know again where do we begin the story so i know you spoke about the terror and all of that but the story perhaps does not begin there it begins um for that for that wanting the control over the resources and then also the question but, but let, let me ask you a question about that because i mean the xinjiang by the way it's the official name is the xinjiang uyghur province that's the official chinese name so 
uh, the genocide is not even happening in the name. It's called the Uyghur province. Um, Xinjiang has been part of China without question since, before, since 1911. In fact, before that, during the imperial times. Um, it's not that China needs to control the minerals. Those are Chinese lands. That's their minerals. You know, th this is not China contesting in a foreign country. It's their land. You know, it's, it's the country. Now, people are saying that the Uyghur province should be independent. That's a separate issue. Um, you know, the, movement. But, but that's also a separate issue mm. because, you know, what's interesting is I looked at the links. Yeah. Not one Chinese or actually Chinese debate about what's happening in China is a multiplicity of opinions about things. Mm. There's 1.4 billion people. I publish oh. a, a journal called Wen Hua Zhang Heng, the international edition, which comes out in English, Spanish and Portuguese. And we publish a range of opinion on different issues. Um, Chinese intellectuals debating with each other. It's a very interesting issue. Um, you know, what do the Chinese think about things? Very in you say, people say, well, let's listen to the people. Why keep citing American authors uh, or mm -hmm. German authors? You know, why not ask the Chinese? That's interesting. They say, well, one there's... The, one of the co-signees in that letter, I think, was the Uyghur Association. So I'm hoping... No, no, I'm not, I'm not talking. I'm talking about the citation. What mm. is cited? You know, mm. um, it's interesting that all the articles are American uh, or in American publications um, at the time when there's a heightened propaganda war between the United States and China. It mm. would be interesting. All I'm saying is it would be interesting for the so sake of, 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 of interest. What are the debates in China? Um, my, my colleague Wang Hui, who is one of the most respected scholars, um, at, he's at uh, teaches in Tsinghua University in Beijing. Uh, my institute just released a text by him on um, how to understand China in world history. But, uh, um, you know, Wang Hui has been writing, he's been traveling to, um, to Xinjiang, to Tibet, to all the various so-called minority areas in China. And he's been writing about this with great feeling and, and, and respect for people. Why not engage with somebody like that? Um, mm -hmm. These same kinds of people attack Wang Hui because they say, well, he's a Han. Um, you know, and somebody on Facebook the other day said to me, you're a you're a you're an upper caste Indian. I'm not even I'm a Sikh. I come from a Sikh family. I'm not even a bloody our caste thing is different than that. You know, um, and the person attacking me, I was like, man, I don't even know what your background is. That's dumb. You know, mm. engage Wang Hui. Let's listen to what he's saying. Um, and why not? I mean, after all, Australia uh, is an is an Asian country, you know. Uh, it's a neighbor of, I mean, to think of Australia as a continent is absurd. It's an Asian country. It's a neighbor of China. Mark Rudd has just done his PhD thesis on Xi Jinping. He's going to publish it as a book. He just went to Oxford, you know, um, Kevin Rudd, sorry. Kevin Rudd? Kevin Rudd, sorry. I don't know why I said Mark Rudd. Kevin Rudd has just done a PhD on Xi Jinping. It would be interesting. Kevin Rudd actually speaks Chinese. You know, it, mm. he, he, he's an he's a interesting person. Um, you know, just, but look, it. there's something before is, the is evidence. The, the question, yeah. is, is your contention that, look, don't misname it as a genocide? Is that your basic point? That there may be things you don't agree with, there may be things that you don't like, and there may be things that they're doing wrong, but do not mislabel it as a genocide. Is that your basic point in all of this? The, the International Court of Justice has just ruled in January of this year that the Israelis are, con there's plausible evidence of genocide happening against the Palestinians. Um, in this letter about, so-called about me, but really it's about a fantasy, uh, this letter says that I support all these million genocides. You want to inflate the term genocide and not have it be as powerful as it should be, that's up to you. Mm -hmm. But I tend to want to respect the terms of the UN Convention on Genocide. It's pretty precise. And what's happening in Xinjiang is not a genocide. The other things, you can call it other things. You can say you don't like the fact that people are being picked up for re-education, whatever. You can have all kinds of problems. Let's debate the facts. Don't mm. come to me and say, litmus test. Yeah. If you don't use the word genocide, you're a genocide denier. Because that's not the way to have a conversation. Please. I mean, that's a, that's a classic Israeli tactic of saying, if you say there's a genocide happening in, in Palestine, you're an anti-Semite. 
That's what the Israelis say. So somebody says to me, if you don't accept there's a genocide happening against um, the Uyghur, then you're a genocide denier. I, I just find that form of argumentation the opposite of a dialogue. It shuts down conversation. No, I agree. And this, this sort of easy labeling also becomes very problematic to then work your way around. There was, um, there were, there was a question that came from someone else from the group, someone called Sam, and he wanted me to ask you this, so I'll bring this to you. In Dhaka Nations, Prashad explained the demise of the Third World Project by pointing to how elites who had once been brokers between the massive social upsurge across the planet had failed to seriously undermine the deep roots of the landed and financial gentry in the social and political worlds that had been governed from above by imperial powers and their satraps. Darker Nation 1340. What would the alternative have looked like? And what might the result have been in terms of the new international economic order during the 1970s? It's a bit of an academic question. No, but... no, it's a very, it's a very good question because it's going to allow me to say something that might alarm some people. Okay. Let's hear so, it. okay. So um you and I both grew up in India. And um in India, you know, I was born, I, I don't know where you were born. I was born in Calcutta. Yeah. I yeah, I, I was also born in Kolkata. Um, you know, I had a early years in the Naxalite period. I watched the tram catch on fire, that sort of thing. Um, in India, the government blocked land reform and mm. blocked agrarian democracy. You know, and the thing about agrarian democracy is it's not just about having a piece of land. It's about diminishing the social power of the landlord. Um, you know, as a later in life, when I became more political, I was doing my PhD research in Punjab, Haryana, and so on. You'd go to these villages in Haryana, the landlords would shoot at women that tried to go, you know, to the bathroom on the common fields. Um, it was brutal. The, the, the landlord power in the 1980s, and right through even now, you know, brutal mm -hmm. power, brute force, you know, landlords would demand uh, free labor from people called Siri labor in Haryana. This is in the 1990s. Okay, landlords would say, come and you, Nokrani, you come and work in my house so many hours, free labor. Because why? I'm the landlord. Um, mm. In India, this is unchecked. This idea of the landlord as Prabhu, as the Lord, um, mm. which part of, is part of a whole patriarchal structure of the father, you know, the Modi is the Saheb. I mean, he's jokingly called Saheb in his office in Delhi. I mean, this idea of the Prabhu Devta and then all the way down to like the feet, you know, the caste system and wretched soul never uprooted in India. It's interesting to compare to China. It's very interesting because in China, it was wretchedly hierarchical like this. Um, there were landlords everywhere. There were warlords, you know, women had to bind their feet. They had to bow before land, the, you know, lower forms of humanity, as it were, had to get off the road when the landlord was coming, just like in India today. But they abolished everything in the Chinese revolution. They used force, maybe sometimes. Um, they drove landlords out. They re-educated landlords. They said, you can't be like this. They made landlords sit in the middle, yelled at them. This is in the 1950s, you know. At the same time as in India, even the Congress party was welcoming landlords into the Lok Sabha. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they were giving tickets to the landlords to win seats. In China, the landlords were being made to struggle. Um, they, You know, the peasants would struggle against them. Um, you know, there's a terrific book called Fan Shen. Um, you know, written by a great American who went and, and lived in this village for years and, and studied how um, they democratized the countryside. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, democratized the culture. Um, in that sense, China is a much more democratic society than a place like India. And mm -hmm. that's the reason why China's advances have been so rapid. I mean, I'll give you an example. You are in a city like Shanghai. The public transportation system is fantastic. What does that mean? That means when I leave my home and I get into, you know, in very well invested public transport, when I get to the office, I'm not tense. I'm not sitting in a traffic jam. I'm not in a smelly, um, you know, bus that's half broken down or in a totally crowded metro in Delhi trying to get anywhere. 
you know, frustrated. I get to work tense, frustrated, angry. My productivity level is lower. Um, where does this come from? It comes from a complete disregard for working people. You know, there are homes that I visit in India, middle class homes, where they treat their servants with such utter contempt. You know, they yell at them, tell them to go even off. The word, even the word servant, you know. Like, no, it's it's a routine word. It's not even it's not even an analytic word. You said the question is academic. It's not academic at all because here I am talking about a mm -hmm. fact of it's 11 o'clock at night and you're not allowing your servant to sleep, you know, and then the next morning you insist they wake up and get you tea at eight in the morning. You know, there's no concern for the humanity of people. That's landlord culture in the city. It exists mm -hmm. in China. This is not there anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. It has been eradicated. You cannot ask a person who works for you to behave basically as your chattel, you know, to, to basically live in your house and be at your beck and call all night long. It's not going to happen. They are going to, they're going to, there are more strikes in China than there are in the United States, more strike days. Um, they have an active society. Now, you may not want to call it a civil society because whatever, the NGOs don't like to call anything in China a civil society, but they have a society, you know, um, during the COVID pandemic, um, their society visited people. Um, I, when I did a, a series of studies on, on the COVID pandemic in China, um, mm -hmm. there were neighborhood groups who went door to door to ask people, do you want anything? This didn't happen in the West, in Australia, in, in India, only in Kerala um, did the young left-wing students go door to door in Trivandrum. And one of those students, Arya Rajendran, uh, at the age of 21, became the mayor of Trivandrum. Why? Because people thought she was amazing. During the pandemic, she and other students went door to door. Uh, this is what they did there. So was there another road for the elites? Yes, mm -hmm. of course, uh, to liquidate themselves in a way. I mean, in India, the only way to have had it happen was for the elite to say, okay, we're going to forego our land. Um, you know, I... MS Nambudripad, he was a man who was born into immense property. He owned a lot of property in Kerala, came from a Nambudri Brahmin family. He gave all his property away and became a communist. He became gave all his property away, became a communist. That That is respect. I mean, I respect people like that. Um, yeah. Today, instead of having um, a democratic society in India, we have a democracy in a hierarchical society. Um, in China, they may not have elections, but it's a much more democratic society. Uh, you have much less hierarchies. People don't bow and scrape in front of you. Uh, they walk with pride. I, I find that interesting. I'm not, why I said I'm going to say something that will, because people are not expected to say anything positive about China. A, there's a kind of unspoken assumption that you're supposed to just be critical of it and say it's a dictatorship and so on. Um, you know, on the other hand, they have a vibrant society. They were able to abolish poverty. Why can't India abolish poverty? Like it's, it, to me, it's dismal um, walking in an Indian city, city. You know, you see people living on the street, people without health care, starving, desperate, begging. You know, this what you're saying is so true. And uh, this is one of the things that really rankles because when when people are get jingoistic, right, when Indians abroad will say, you know, Indian culture and this and that, and India is a superpower. And I feel like when you go back, and you're going into your gated communities and you're going into the five star hotels. Are you really not seeing what the streets are still like? Are you really not witnessing the, you know, everything that hasn't changed and hasn't moved in so many ways? I mean, I have I have a social worker friend. I mean, she works in she works in um in women, in women's care and all of that. And she says, when I go into the villages in Bengal, you cannot even imagine the level of poverty. You cannot even fathom it. That people literally have no food. People literally have one sari that they wear, wear through the whole year. And, you know, and we're talking about India shining and all of that. And, you know, again, there can be multiple multiple narratives. But this is a stark truth that we can't run away from. That India is so desperately poor in so many ways. And... You know, the sugar coating in, in NRI spaces, it really rankles when they just want to talk about how India is so amazing and, and you know, culturally has everything to offer the world. But we can't solve poverty. So that's that's a really yeah. big question. And, and, and the attack on China 
the concerted ideological attack on China is also an attack on our possibilities. So we, mm -hmm. if we don't see how China was able to abolish poverty, we don't recognize that, mm -hmm. then we don't have any, you know, what do you turn to? I mean, you asked a question from Sam, I think. Um, you asked a question about well, what else could the elites have done? Well, you're, you're not supposed to say, well, but, but let's look and see how did they abolish poverty? You know, it's a country of 1.4 billion. It's not like them saying it. The UN went and verified, said, this is amazing. And by the way, some of this comes to the question of Xinjiang and, and to Tibet and all of that, because what they did find when in the last 10 years was that the last bastions of poverty were amongst the minority people of China. And that was a failing of the previous governments. And this government decided when they directly frontally uh, had to challenge poverty, they had to go in there and in a sense make peace with um, what had been a serious failure of the Chinese revolution, which is to actually understand the minority question, the Miao mm. people, the, the you know Tibetans and so on. And this is where the work was done. You know, over a thousand something cadre of the Communist Party died in this poverty eradication or alleviation program uh, because they had to go and sacrifice. You know, they worked in edge places. Many of them died of dysentery and various things. They went in there and did the work. And because we say, well, no, it's a dictatorship or, you know, everything is bad there, then we can't understand the few good things that one can learn. It's a very interesting way to screen out, you know, say that, okay, mm. we can't talk about China. Well, then let's just talk yeah. about India shining, you know, yeah. and whatever, Hinduism and the Ram temple and, you know, well, Modi's shaking hands with uh, Biden and whatnot. Yes, the optics, the optics look great. So let's just go from there. Um, one thing that you have spoken about is the need for negotiations, right? And the fact that, you know, the world needs to learn how to negotiate. And I wonder what that world means when we're looking at, like, what can the Palestinians negotiate anymore with Israel? Like, what does a community, you can negotiate when you're holding on to something that is not available to them without you voluntarily handing it over. But when everybody, when you can just go in there and take out who you want or take what you want or do what you want, what do you negotiate in this new world yeah. order? How do you negotiate? It's an excellent, this question makes me want to cry. It's an excellent question. And, you know, I've been to Gaza. I've been to the West Bank. Your question makes me want to cry because I don't really, I, I really don't know what to say. I've lost a lot of friends in this conflict. Um, people's homes that I stayed in, in Gaza City and, and so on. I, I just, you know, I don't know what to say to you, except that, um, you know, as the world um, turns to understand what's happening there and no longer will allow the sugar coating of the violence, you know, as, as the world moves in that direction, um, even, you know, governments like the Indian government, where Modi is personally friendly with and now sent him birthday greetings and so on. But the Indian government is still talking about a two state solution. This is a positive sign, you know, in my opinion. Um, that's the only leverage that's left. You know, th there's no other leverage. I mean, there are people who will be they will be rendered extinct, um, you know, except in the diaspora. Um, you know, I mean. I, I don't know, really, I really struggle with this because um, it's easy to say things. It's difficult to imagine them. Um, there are two functioning hospitals in North Gaza. Just before um, we started speaking, I, I, I very rarely stay in a hotel that has um, television that, you know, I, I put on Al Jazeera. And I was watching live footage of, of hitting a hospital. And you know, and, and they were striking. I used to live in Beirut and there was footage of, of rocket fire into a densely populated area of Beirut. I know that street, you know, and, and it's densely populated. And the Israelis were saying, well, we're getting Hezbollah. There are lots of people that live in those areas. There's, they're going to just wipe families out and, and so on. What's the leverage? The only leverage is that the United States and Germany has to stop arming Israel. You know, 80% of the big bombs dropped by Israel are American. 20% are German. 
um, the German foreign minister just made a statement in the Bundestag, you know, in the parliament. She made a statement saying that if Hamas is hiding behind civilians, then the civilians are a military target. That is a violation of international law, what she said, because it gives Israel license to kill civilians. You know, the it's the abundant abundance of caution principle. Uh, international law says that a fighting force has to have an abundance of caution not to hit civilians. It doesn't say that if there's a shooter behind a civilian, you can kill the civilian. You have to have an abundance of caution. That means you hold your fire. Let the shooter keep shooting. You take cover. Hold your fire until you can get a clean shot of the combatant. You can't kill the civilian. The, what is she talking about? She's the foreign minister of Germany. Yeah. It's like the world gone mad. It does I, seem like the world gone mad. Because the things that our leaders are saying, you wouldn't even say in a living room, you know, you would be ashamed to say the things that are coming out of people's mouths now. You know, and we talk about things like uh, religious intolerance and all of that and people drawing these very strong borders between them. And, you know, this is what it makes your heart ache because this is the end of that. This is where it ends. This is where, this is the, the nightmare that you're leaving for the world when you start dividing people on those lines. Gosh, I know it is It is a very emotive topic. No, I mean, I'm also sorry. because because you're a poet, you know, the way you said that line, this is where it ends, uh, feels T.S. Eliot and horrifying, you know, this is where it ends. I mean, shit, you know, uh, I mean, is this where it ends? I just, I, I, I did an interview with Roger Waters. We started a series of his, you know, songs that I love and that people don't listen to much. And the first one was on the song, The Last Refugee. And it's a beautiful song. There's two parts to it. The first part is a, is a love poem to a person he loves. And it's a beautiful, it's a really charming poem of love. The second part is about a child um, on the beach and... Um, you may remember the Turkish child, the, the uh, Syrian child who was found, Elan Kurd, who was found dead on the beach. Um, yes. That had just happened. And, and so Roger writes this second part of the poem about the last refugee. And so, you know, I asked him, what do you mean? And, you know, he said, like, interpreting lyrics for you is like pulling off. Lyrics are supposed to fly and be beautiful, not be interpreted like. Anyway, but I said to him, I said, you know, to me, it's always seemed like the last refugee is like the end of the world. This is where it ends. And he said, no. He said, you, you've misread the song. He said, it's actually the opposite. He said, I want a world where there is that last refugee. And after that, there's no more refugees. That we can imagine a world without refugees, that people can move. I have chills with that. <laughs> yeah, and he said that's what the last refugee refers to, and and that moved me a lot. And so when you said, you know, this is this is where it ends, and I feel like yes, that's right. This is where that madness ends, and something else has to be born. And you know, it, we are never spectators of history. You know, we can actually change the course of history. It's not predetermined. You know, we act in the world. We change the course of history. That's why you do a show like this. That's why you're in. That's why you write poetry. You want to change the course of history. Poets want to change the imagination. They want people to imagine different things. That's trying to change the course of history. You write a poem. Somebody reads it, they're influenced by it. It changes what they do. They lead a mass movement and they transform the world. It could start with a line. This is where it ends or the last refugee it moves somebody, you know. And so, I mean, this is where it ends is what? It's their world is going to end. But when is our world going to be born? And that's what I spend my life thinking about. You know, we've the conversation's gone everywhere, and I think I could spend like uh, another couple of hours talking about all of this. But I did read that the writer Amitav Kumar, he said that your writing of protest is always tinged with the beauty of hope. And then I I made a note of uh, Emily Dickinson's poem that you know hope is a thing with feathers, 
and uh, and I was thinking, butterfly and you know that's funny it's, yeah. uh, so this is the thing that even though I mean you know I, as you're being attacked and all of that and you know there might be things that are legitimate there, there might be things that you have answers for but what I do see is someone engaged you're all in right you're all in and you're taking a stand and you know, I, I wish for a world where more people would come out there and take a stand, you know, and fight for the things that we believe in. So thank you for the work you do. I hope the people who have things to say to you get an opportunity to really grill you and find answers. But together, we have to sort of everybody has to work together in ways that we we respect differences and we can work through them. So thank you so much for your time. It's a great pleasure. Thanks a lot. And good luck with the show. Thank you so much.